Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's colloquium at afternoon, our extra colloquium. Uh, we have uh, Professor Alan Aspect from Paris Sud University, and I will kindly ask uh, Professor Bill Phillips to introduce him. Well, it's a, a great pleasure for me to introduce Alan Aspe, and one of the reasons for that is that I have learned so much from him. Uh, and he's uh, uh, doing the, the typical French. <laughs> you know how the French are when they want to denigrate something, they go. <laughs> but uh, uh, of course, I've learned a great deal of physics from Alain. I've also learned how to speak French from Alain because we shared an office in, uh, in Paris and he uh, instructed me in, uh, in French and I'm tremendously grateful for that. Uh, of course, Alain has taught us all a great deal and uh, Alain is particularly famous for the experiment that uh, was, uh, was mentioned this morning, uh, the testing of the uh, uh, of the einstein podolsky rosen uh, uh, paradox and uh, of Bell's inequalities. And this is one of the experiments that is probably uh, one of the few landmark experiments that everyone would, would agree is an important part of our understanding of, uh, of our physical world. And when I consider what an important experiment it is, because it showed that the world is really so weird. The thing that Einstein objected to about quantum mechanics was he simply could not believe that the world was as weird as quantum mechanics predicted it to be. The genius of Einstein was that he realized how weird quantum mechanics predicted the world could be and objected to that. And the genius of Alain Aspe is that he did the experiment that showed <laughs> that indeed the world was as weird as Einstein said that it could not be. And today we're going to hear more about that kind of weirdness that uh, we as physicists find so appealing and that Einstein found so appalling. Um, and I, I must say that I was a bit uncomfortable this morning hearing both myself and Alain uh, be introduced because I think that you might have gotten the idea this morning that I was more famous than Alain, but of course that's not true. <laughs> Many more people know Alain's name uh, than mine, and uh, I just want to tell a story to illustrate that. One time I was arriving in Paris and someone was picking me up, and they picked me up in a car and were driving me to central Paris, and I was speaking with them in French, thanks to the good instruction that I had from Alain. And, uh, and the person was asking me, why was I speaking such good French? And I said, well, I spent a year in France uh, in the research group of Claude Cohen-Tanucci. Uh, no, uh, she didn't know who Claude Cohen-Tanucci was, who shared the Nobel Prize uh, with me and Steve Chu. And, but I, and, and I said, and, and I shared an office with Alain Aspe. Oh, yes, of course, Alain Aspe. So uh, uh, with that, I give you Alain Aspe. <laughs> Thank, thank you very much, uh, Bill. <laughs> what could I expect from you? <laughs> yes, I'm going to talk about uh, one uh, aspect of the weirdness of uh, quantum mechanics, but not the one that Einstein discovered with Podolsky and Rosen, something much simpler, but which anyway I think uh, also put us in the core of real quantum behavior. So it will be about single photon wave particle duality from Einstein's to Wheeler's, to Wheeler, so this young Einstein, and this John Archibald Wheeler, who passed away a couple of years ago. And a little bit of advertising. If you want to know more about the details of the calculation of what I am going to explain today, you can find it in this book. I am one of the co-authors, and I wrote explicitly a compliment in this book describing in detail this experiment, because I think that this experiment allows us to better understand, or at least penetrate, into the subtleties of quantum mechanics. 
So this is a kind of introduction you like to have in a general uh, colloquium. You know, it was a tradition in France 30 years ago that any uh, thesis in physics should start by Aristotle already asked the following question. Why is the hyperfan structure of iterbium <laughs> so and so like that, you know? So we have to go into a little bit of uh, history. But when it comes to light, it really makes sense because, of course, light has fascinated mankind. And uh, when you go into antiquity, you find many interesting models of light. For instance, here, this model from the Egyptian is very interesting. The sun is sending light as made as many flowers with many different colors. In a sense, it's not so different from the model of Newton, except that Newton did experiments to separate and show that the various flowers would go uh, in different channels out of the prism. Of course, so there are many models. And then let us make uh, a big jump to Middle Age. In Middle Age, they were not so conceptual but it's good for us. They made tremendous progress in technique, in engineering. And for instance, they invented this small object here, who is very useful for people who pass 40 to 50 years old, OK? Um, because it, it allows you to see even when your arms are not long enough to be able to, to read the, the newspaper. They also, as you know, invented uh, telescope, microscope, etc., etc. And then after this tremendous progress in engineering, in the 17th century, again, they asked the fundamental question, but what is really light? And then there was this big debate between Huygens and Newton, and Huygens considered that light was made of waves, while in contrast, Newton thought that light was made of particles. And, of course, the authority of Newton was such that he really uh, won this contest. And uh, he won for many good reasons. First, he had invented, uh, well, discovered the law of gravitation and was able to make sense of the motion of planets. And this, of course, was such an achievement that he had a great credit. And also, one must say that his experiments in optics are fantastic except that he sometimes had to find far-fetched models. For instance, for understanding the Newton rings that we very easily understand as interference, it was really a very far-fetched uh, uh, model. But anyway, Huygens uh, lost, okay, and Newton uh, triumphed, and this for more than one century. Then, at the beginning of the 19th century, Two absolute genius, I mean, they are really my heroes, Young on one side of the channel and Fresnel on the other side of the channel. And they demonstrated that in order to understand interference, diffraction, polarization, you must admit that light is a wave, a wave which is transverse, okay? Oscillates transverse, otherwise you cannot have polarization. But they did not know at all what was the nature of the wave. And it, they had to wait, or we had, or people had to wait for another half of a century until we know what is the nature of this wave. And this wave is an electromagnetic wave as correctly derived by Maxwell. And then it seems that it was the end of it. In, at the beginning of the 20th century, everything was absolutely clear. There is a famous sentence of Lord Kelvin that physics is completed. The only thing which is left is to measure with more and more accuracy various constants. Actually, it turned out that last summer, I went in details into this sentence by Kelvin. And Kelvin was not stupid at all. Because he said, everything is completed. We understand everything except for two clouds. And he did not say two minor clouds. He said two dark clouds. And the two dark clouds were, on the one hand, the between code negative result of the Michelson experiment. And we know that this uh, 
evolved into relativity. And the other cloud was something not clear with the equipartition of energy. And the only way you can solve and settle the problem is by discovering, by describing it with quantum mechanics. So we should not laugh at Kelvin. It was really good. OK, so light is a wave. Light is an electromagnetic wave. And suddenly, early 20th century, photons, particles, come back. And here, Einstein plays a particularly important role. Of course, everybody knows of Planck, 1900. But Planck did not say that light is made of quanta. Planck said, let us admit that exchanges of energy are quantized. The exchange of energy between radiation and matter is quantized. And it was enough to derive the Planck law of radiation. Einstein made a much greater step. He said, let us admit that light itself is made of quanta, elementary grains of energy with a momentum. And this was named photon only later. Okay, Einstein called it Licht quantum. And with this, Einstein made precise prediction for the photoelectric effect. And then nobody believed it. And just to give you an idea, in 1913, Einstein had already accomplished a lot. And then he was elected at the Academia of Prussia, uh, yes, Prussian, Prussian Academy of Science. And we have the letter which was written by Planck, Rubens, and many people, the report, OK? And they clearly say, of course, sometimes Einstein is really wrong. For instance, with this strange law for the photoelectric effect. But he has already done so many good things that we are going to forgive him and elect him anyway. Okay? And this lasted until Millikan, a fantastic experimentalist, as you say, embarked into experiments to disprove Einstein's law of the photoelectric effect. You, you have just to read the memories of Millikan. He explicitly said, I embarked into that to disprove the law. And after two years of hard work, he concluded that Einstein was right. Well, good. And the Nobel Prize for Einstein was explicitly given for the photoelectric effect. OK, and then there were compound experiments. And so at this point, it was clear that last light, or more generally radiation, has to be considered as made of photons. But of course, we should not forget about the past. How to reconcile the particle description with typical wave phenomena like diffraction, interference, polarization, for which Young and Fresnel had shown explicitly that you need to have a wave-like model, a wave model. How to reconcile both? Well. The solution is called wave-particle duality. Einstein was obsessed by the problem. As soon as he wrote his paper of 1905, he was obsessed by the equation. Obviously, Einstein was not stupid. He knew of interference and diffraction. And really reconciling his vision that light is made of quanta with the fact that it is a wave was an obsession. And there is a fantastic text called the Salzburg Conference. So he delivered a conference in Salzburg, but you can find the text. Uh, you can find it in German, in English translation, in French translation, maybe Portuguese, who knows. And uh, this conference is fantastic. And among many arguments that light is both wave and particle, there is one that I like to uh, sketch here. Einstein was able to calculate the fluctuation of the black body radiation. And for doing that, he was considering a big vessel. And he, there was a mobile piston. And there were radiation on one side, particles on the other side. And he would apply constraints, thermodynamic equilibrium. And at the end, he could calculate correctly the fluctuation. What he was calculating is the radiation pressure on the, on the, on the moving wall. Okay. And he could calculate the fluctuation of that. So it gave him the fluctuation of the black body radiation. And what he found is this. So this is the fluctuation of black body radiation. And you have two terms here. And he correctly recognized that this term is a term that we would call shot noise. 
That is to say, the term that you would have if radiation was made with particles uh, at uh, randomly position, okay, with a Poisson distribution. Okay? And you would have this particle arriving on the, on the wall, on the moving wall, and you would have fluctuation. Okay? So this is the first term. And the second term, he correctly recognized that it is a term which is associated to bit note between waves with random phases. And these bit notes provoke a fluctuation in the intensity, and so it will make fluctuation in the radiation pressure on the moving wall. And seeing this formula, saying, OK, fluctuation have two terms. One term I can interpret as random particles. One term I can interpret as waves. So it just means that light is both wave and, parti wave and particle. Well, this is impressive. 1909, again, before Bohr, before everybody. This is unbelievable. Later, you know that Louis de Broglie in 1923 came with the hypothesis that, reversely, things that we think are particles, such as electrons, behave like a wave. And they are able to give diffraction interference. This has been demonstrated, etc., etc. So it seems that there is no more problem. Wave particle duality is the answer to the equation, is like a wave or a particle. But you know, if you think about it, you can sing wave particle duality, you can repeat wave particle duality. What does it mean? Can you represent what is wave particle duality with images? I was fascinated by this equation since when I was a student. And I was happy to have a chance to be uh, interested and contribute to this question. And this is what I am going to tell you now. But before uh, emphasizing the conceptual difficulties with wave particle duality, I want first to emphasize that wave particle duality has been extraordinarily fruitful because it's basically the concept at the root of Schrodinger equation. It's a concept which is at the root of understanding the structure of matter, its property, interaction with light, you know, electrical, mechanical, optical properties, understanding exotic properties like superfluidity, supraconductivity, Bosanchan condensate. Moreover, Wave particle duality, that is to say standard quantum physics, has allowed physicists to invent new devices like laser, transistor, integrated circuits, that is to say all which is at the root of the information and communication society. But when you think carefully about all that, you this, and you look at all the books using quantum mechanics to describing that, you find that it is always about quantum mechanics applied to large ensembles. And you may ask the question, how to apply quantum mechanics to a single particle? Does it work for a single particle? And then, of course, you have the famous textbook of Feynman, which tells you, yes, it works for a single particle. And so Feynman describes the following experiment. You have a source emitting particles, quantum particles, one after the other one, well separated. There is never two particles at a time in the apparatus, OK? And you have two holes here, and you have a detector. And the detector is giving a click when the particle arrives on the detector. And you slowly scan here, and what you find is that the rate of detection, the probability of detection, has a sinusoidal modulation, like that, when you scan. And of course, well, you, you, you all know physics, and you know that the only, no, sorry. But then, when you close one of the two holes, then the probability of detection is absolutely uniform. And you know that the only reasonable interpretation for that is to say that to each particle, we associate a wave. The wave passes simultaneously through both holes and recombines here. And then, according to the, depending on the path difference between the first path and the second path, you either have constructive or destructive interference, etc., etc. So this is what Feynman tells us. And many people try to observe the effect. And the most natural idea, again, I repeat, in this experiment, what you want, you want to have only one particle at a time in the apparatus. And the most natural idea was to say, let us use faint light. 
let us take a source and attenuate it so much that the beam of photon is so weak that the average distance between two photons is much larger than the size of the apparatus. And the most uh, impressive experiment of that point of view was the first one performed as early as 1909 by an English aristocrat, Mr. Taylor, or an English yachtman. And this gentleman liked physics, but he liked yachting also. So what he was looking for is an experiment giving him plenty of time to go yachting, so what, to go sailing. So what he did was to set up an experiment with a very weak source of light, attenuate it, put a needle, and observe the diffraction pattern of the needle by taking a photographic plate, and it had to last, according to his calculation, for about six months, because he attenuated the light very much. So he went sailing for six months, came back, developed the photo, and observed the diffraction pattern. And he said, in my apparatus, there is only one photon at a time, and so uh, the photon makes diffraction that is, behaves as a wave. And there is a full, so a full series of experiments where people use attenuated light to test the wave character of very attenuated light, and with the exception of one experiment, but apparently there was something wrong in that experiment, some people criticized it for some reason, all the experiments show that yes, indeed, very attenuated light, faint light, behaves like a wave, although in the average there is only one photon in the apparatus. Does it mean single particle interference? I'm going to argue now that no, this was not single particle interference. And I have many arguments, and I am going to explain it. First, a theoretical argument. Mr. Glaube developed, long ago, 40 years ago, a formalism showing that when you take a beam of light, whatever the nature of the light, if you attenuate it enough, then what goes out of your attenuator is described by what is called a quasi-classical state. We call it also Glauber coherent state or Glauber quasi-classical state. And when light is described by such a quantum state, then any kind of calculation you can do about that light, any kind of correlation function, the famous G1 or G2, doesn't dip if you don't understand what it is, it doesn't matter. I mean, any quantity you want to calculate with these quantum states, you will get exactly the same result as the result you would find if you were describing light as a wave, as a classical wave. That's all about the quasi-classical state of Glauber, okay? And so, Glauber is telling us you should not confuse a very attenuated beam of light with single and well-separated photons, okay? Of course, some of you, and one here, for instance, will come and say, but what about the photoelectric effect? Is not the photoelectric effect demonstrating the necessity of the photon? After all, Einstein derived this law because of the photoelectric effect. Well, actually, we can easily argue, and again, there is uh, an exercise in the, in the quite good book I uh, refer to in the first slide. You can make a semi-classical model of the photoelectric effect in which you don't quantize light. Light is described as a classical oscillating electric field, but you do quantize matter. So this is a very simple model of an atom with a ground state and a continuum of ionized state. You forget about the intermediate states that you have here, okay? And it's very easy to demonstrate that with such a model, all the known properties of the photoelectric effect are perfectly described. For instance, you are going to have ionization only if h bar omega is bigger than the, the, the gap that you have here, etc., etc. All the well-known properties of the photoelectric effect can be described with such a model. And at this point, you say, but what was wrong with Einstein? But nothing was wrong with Einstein. At the time of Einstein, nothing was quantized. Neither matter, nor light. And a full classical model, where you quantize neither matter nor light, cannot render an account of the photoelectric effect. 
Einstein decided to quantize light, could render an account of the photoelectric effect. He could have chosen to quantize matter. He would have been able to render an account of the photoelectric effect. But from a modern point of view, we cannot say that the photoelectric effect demands quantization of light. OK. So how could we make a further step and check the equation whether or not we can have, in such an experiment, independent particles? Well, I think this would be the experiment to make. And we came with this idea with Philippe Grangier in the early 80s that if we consider Feynman's diagram, but now we put a detector here and a detector there and look for coincidence, if there is only one particle at a time in the apparatus, obviously either D1 or D2 will fire, but the two detectors will not be fired, uh, activated simultaneously. Okay? So if really I have single independent particles, we should have a rate of detection of joint detection here equal to zero, while here and there I have random detection. Okay? In contrast, if you think of a wave, a wave would simultaneously pass here and there, and you could have joint detection. This is the idea of the test to know whether or not we can have, we can have single photon in such an apparatus. But then, OK, so the idea is that a single particle cannot be split, an opposite behavior for a wave. But then we came, well, such an experiment had not been realized until the moment when we began to think about it. And I was really surprised that such an experiment had never been done. And I realized that, in, ca in fact, the particle nature was considered obvious for electron, neutron, atom, molecules. And for this object, people were only looking for wave-like wave effects. I would not try to demonstrate that an electron is a particle. Okay? So the equation was to be raised only in the case of light. And in the case of faint light, people had never thought about what I have shown in the previous transparency. They considered obvious that when you attenuate a beam, it's like separated photon, and they did not know well enough about Glauber's work. OK. So we decided to embark into an experiment, but as all reasonable experimentalists in modern quantum optics, we know that Young slit or young holes is nice in principle. It's a good device for theorists. But for experimentalists, there is a device which is much better to do experiments. It's beam splitter. And so we rephrase the argument in the following way. Let's suppose you send a single particle on a beam splitter. It will go either on one side or on the other side. So if you look at joint detection between this detector and that detector, you expect to have probability of coincidence equal zero, if it is really a single photon. In contrast, if you have a wave, which is split into parts, this is wrong, single particle, we, OK? If you, now have, uh, if you have a wave split in two parts, then you have a certain probability to activate simultaneously this detector and that detector. And so, for light, you expect probability of joint detection different from zero. So, if light behaves as particle, probability of joint detection is zero. If light behaves as a wave, probability of joint detection is different from zero. But do you know how to distinguish zero from non-zero? If you are a mathematician, I'm sure you know zero is clearly different from anything else. If you are a theorist in physics, depends on which side you are, okay? If you are closer to the but if you are an experimentalist, obviously, distinguish zero from non-zero is nonsense. I mean, you need to have a certain barrier, error bars, and something like that. And so thinking about that, we came for the f with the following reasoning. Let's suppose that we have a wave, which is cut into part here. Then we are going to have a minimum rate of coincidence predicted for this model. And this is the reasoning. If you have the wave split into parts, 
then the probability of joint detection is going to be proportional to the square of the intensity. Okay? Now, on the other hand, the single probability on this detector or on that detector are proportional to the intensity. And of course, you may have fluctuations, so you have to consider averages of the intensity. And there is a very well known Cauchy Schwartz inequality, everybody knows it. Average of the square is bigger than or equal to the square of the average. And when you compare this to this formula, you immediately find that you predict that if you have a wave here, then the rate of joint detection, of coincidence detection, should be bigger, or the probability of joint detection should be bigger than or equal to the product of single probabilities. If some of you have worked with coincidence counting, here, this is called accidental coincidence. You can never have less than accidental coincidence, okay? Good. So, if it is a wave, alpha should be bigger than one. And if it is a particle, well, should be zero in principle. But even if it is not zero because of noise or uh, of uh, problems, if it is less than one, it cannot be a wave, okay? So, now we have a criterion for particle-like behavior. It is like that alpha should be less than one. Good. We embarked first on a very simple experiment. We take a small classical source, a light emitting diode, emitting pulses with a length of a few nanoseconds, okay? Send it on an attenuator and make a calculation such that in the average, there is 10 to the minus two photon going out of the attenuator. So in the average, it's one hundredth of a photon. And we do the measurement. What happens? Well, first, what does it mean, one hundredth of a photon? It means that 99% of the time you observe nothing, and 1% of the time you observe something, okay? Then, we send it on the beam splitter. We measure P1, P2, and PC. And guess what we found? We found the behavior predicted by a, for a wave, exactly what Mr. Glauber has taught us. When you attenuate a source, whatever you do, at the end of the day, you have a behavior like a wave, okay? And the reason for that can be understood in the following way. Normally, you should describe it as a wave, but if you insist for speaking of particles, you are going to have a Poisson distribution for such an attenuated wave, okay? And in a Poisson distribution, the, if it is very attenuated, Probability to have zero is large. For instance, in my case, it was 99%. Probability of having one is small. But probability of having two is not zero. It's about the square of the probability of having one, which means that in that experiment here, from time to time, I have two particles. And if I have two particles, they can both go on one side, but maybe one will go on one side, the other one will go on the other side. And when you do the statistics, you find that it is exactly the right quantity to come to alpha equal one. So, indeed, I think we have proven that all the experiments with faint line cannot be considered experiments with single photons. Okay, so. Are there means to produce single photon state of light? And can we demonstrate experimentally the single particle behavior? Well, if you think about what would be, and at that time, 30 years ago, there was no source for single photon. But if you think about it, the simplest way is the following. Take a single atom, put it in an excited state, and wait. And the only thing that the atom can do is deliver one and only one photon. Because if, it, if, the, if the atom was delivering more than one photon, there would be some violation of energy somewhere, okay? And again, if you look into the good book I have shown, you will find the demonstration of that, okay? So the idea would be to take a single atom and then take the photon going out of the single atom and look for the test. But the problem is that 30 years ago, there was nothing like a single atom. People had not yet found a way, you know, to trap a single ion or a single atom or something like that. And, uh, 
But there were some first experiments, okay? Kimball, Dagenet, and Mandel had been observed, had been able to observe anti-bunching. John Clauser had been able to observe non-classical effect for light. And so thinking about it, we realized that with a cascade, with a radiative cascade that we have developed to test the Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen, Bell's inequality, we could in fact isolate single photon effect. Not that we had a single photon in the, big, in the vacuum chamber which is here. We had millions of atoms excited simultaneously. But here, we excite the atom to the upper level. And now, once they are excited, they emit a first photon, a green photon, and then a second photon. And this has allowed us to isolate single photon effect or single atom effect in time. And the idea is the following. The two photons here are separated by a few nanoseconds. The lifetime is five nanoseconds. So you have two, once you detect the first photon, you are sure that the second one is going to be emitted, let's say, in the next 10 nanoseconds. And in our source, the average rate of excitation of the atoms was more like 10 to the 6 per second, which means that in the average between two cascades, you have 1,000 nanoseconds. So actually, when you look at what was emitted by that source, it was green-blue, then nothing for a while. Then green-blue, then nothing for a while. So if I could isolate this sequence green-blue, then I am sure to have access to a single, photon to single atom phenomenon, and so to a single photon. So finally, the idea was very simple, to observe the first photon with a detector, and look during the next 10 nanoseconds, and then stop everything and wait again until we observe a single green photon. Okay? So this is the way, the, so this is the way we did the experiment, and with that, we found alpha clearly less than one. So you are going to tell me, why not zero? Well, not zero, because uh, there is also dark counts, and so is there is an accidental rate with a dark rate of the detectors, etc. So it was a clear particle-like behavior. OK. 20 years later, this kind of experiment has been repeated by our friends Jean-François Roque and his team in the NS Cachan. And I would like to say that when compared you know, to this big room full of lasers, etc., producing single photon nowadays is really so simple that it is a little disgusting. Okay. So what they do is the following thing. They take a microscope, they have a very diluted medium on it, they have a confocal microscope, so that they can look only at one molecule. And they are going to shine a green laser on that molecule. It's a four-level system. They will excite it to the upper level. They wait, and finally, you have a single photon. It's really very simple. So this is what you do. You excite with a pulse laser, and you get a red or an infrared or a red photon coming here. And you can do the test, and you find alpha clearly less than one. So this is a very good source for single photon. It's much simpler, etc., etc. OK. So <coughs> the question, when you have such a source, is the following. Now we have a source which produces a single photon. Are we going to observe interference with a single photon? So, the equation boils down to the following equation. Let us suppose we introduce a single photon in such an interferometer, for instance, Max Zender interferometer. Are we going to observe a modulation of the rate of detection here or there as a function of the path difference? Will it be sinusoidally modulate when I have one and only one photon? Of course, we did the experiment with Philippe Grangier 25 years ago, and this is what we observed. If we were patient enough to let the statistics build on, then we had a beautiful modulation of the probability of detection here or there as a function. So now again, OK, my problem. And we had a, a beautiful uh, modulation of the probability of detection on one side or on in the other side. OK. Now, surprise. Surprise, surprise. Good. Okay. 
So you see here, we had an example of an experiment which was done in the single photon regime because we were using exactly the same source which produced single photon as the source used to test that it was indeed a single photon. So we had an unambiguous wave-like behavior in the single photon regime. This is the way the experiment has been done in Cachan, more recently. Rather than using a Max Zender interferometer, they have used, we participate in this experiment, they have used a Fresnel B-prism. So you know a Fresnel B-prism is a nice system. You have a point-like source here. You expand the beam. Uh, the upper part of the beam is deflected down by the prism. The lower part of the beam is deflected up by the prism. I think I know I should have changed the pattern. We are going to look into coincidence or non-coincidence detection between the two detectors which are here, right? So we do the experiment and the anti-correlation detector D1 and D2 gives alpha clearly less than one, which means that indeed, although we have a beam which apparently is wide, photon is passing either up or down, right? This is a conclusion of alpha less than one. Okay, now we put a screen at the time of Fresnel, you put a screen and try to look for a fringe pattern, an interference pattern. Now we have modern means, a CCD camera, computer, and we can observe in the overlap and we can even register the signal with the computer and everything and I'm going to show you the result. So these real data observed with a source of single photon. Wow, it's remarkably fast. But for some reason, it, it's not dark. This is another problem. What happens? Oh, Two mini messages. So, wow. Two mini messages. So let us try to start it again. Now it should work if we are patient. And we are patient. Mm -hmm. I tried it before. Should I resist to try to open a second time, Bill? <laughs> okay, let us try. So it will come two times now. Now, one. And only one. Okay. So, you see exactly what we are doing here. What we are doing here is observing with a CCD camera, we observe what happens here. And this is the CCD that we have here. And each time a photon is going to be detected, we are going to have a red spot. So, let us start the observation. And this is real data, okay? Okay, so you see the points, okay? detection of photons, okay, and you see, and what we do, we accumulate the data on vertical lines, and this is the histogram we have here, and probably I don't have to comment, you see the photons arriving nicely on the bright fringes, and no photon going on the dark fringes, a beautiful pattern, and you can render a full account of the pattern by taking into account the real uh, geometry of the experiment, etc., etc. Isn't that beautiful? And this, again, is done with a source where we have checked that the photon either goes up or goes down. Alpha is less than one. Okay, I think you are convinced. Maybe we go to the end anyway to show how beautiful it is. Okay. And let us close it. Okay. So what do we have? We have an unambiguous wave-like behavior in the single photon regime. It's the same experiment as the one we did 25 years ago, but now we can register it and show it. Okay. So what have we, have we shown? We have shown wave particle duality for single particles. We did with Grangier a first experiment in which we observed about probability of joint detection equals zero, which means that when we send the photon here, it goes either up or down, <coughs> but never on both sides simultaneously. Then, with the same source, 
we did that experiment. And in that experiment, we observed that the probability of detection here is modulated as a function of the pass difference. And this, you can understand it only by accepting that it is split in two and recombined. Otherwise, you could not have such a modulation. But look, it's the same single photon wave packet, the same source, the same beam splitter, and we have contradictory images. So what should we do? Call Mr. Bohr. Mr. Bohr, help. What should we do? And of course, we have Bohr's complementarity. Bohr tells us, look, my young friend, you have to choose either do this experiment or do that experiment. You cannot do both simultaneously, so you should not be worried too much, you know? The equation cannot be asked simultaneously. So, if you read carefully Bohr, Bohr insists that the behavior that you observe depends on the kind of apparatus that you are using. So, if you take that literally, you say, ah, I understand. So, these apparatus being different from that one, when the photon arrives here, it has to decide its behavior according to the apparatus in front of it. Well, if you read Bohr, you know, he insists, the apparatus determines the behavior. So the photon arrives here, you say, ha ha, they are asking, they are trying to find if I am a particle, I'm going to pretend I am a particle. <laughs> and here, the photon say, hmm, I'm well educated, I have a good course in optics, I know, this is a Max Zender and Deformator, so I know I have to pretend I am a wave. Thinking about that, John Archibald Wheeler, which was an extremely subtle man, as we know, came with the following question. We could decide to choose between this apparatus and that apparatus after the photon passes the first beam splitter. Then what would happen? This is so-called so Wheeler's delayed choice experiment. So, we decided to do the experiment and to go from this scheme to that scheme is a little complicated, but we noticed that there is a, well, Wheeler had already shown it in a way that what we can do is slightly modify the experiment. Now, you see here there is no beam splitter. So, this path goes here and that path goes here. And now, to go from the first scheme to the second scheme, there is only one thing you have to do, is either to put or remove the beam splitter. And this you can do more faster. And this is Wheeler's delicious experiment scheme. And this is the vision of Wheeler, of that experiment. The phot single photon wave packet arrives here, it's split into parts, and you have not yet decided either to let them go or to introduce the beam splitter. Okay. So this is how the experiment was done in Institute Optique in collaboration with a team of Cachan. It's a very long interferometer, 50 meters. Okay. Here you split the photon in two parts. I can't go in details. It's polarization splitting. It doesn't matter. They are physically separated. Propagate along 50 meters. And here you recombine the path, but the photons are not yet recombined because the polarization are orthogonal. So here, there is an electro-optic modulator. And if you apply a voltage, you recombine. If you don't apply a voltage, you don't recombine. And so one path will go here, and the other one will go there. And the key point in that experiment is the following. The choice of switching on or switching off the electro-optic modulator, which amounts to introducing or not introducing the beam splitter, was done here randomly and fast enough that clearly at the moment when it happened, the photon was somewhere in the middle, traveling in the middle of the, uh, of the um, interferometer, okay? So there was total separation between here the choice and the entrance of the, uh, of the beam splitter. It was relativistically separated. Okay. So what did we observe? Unfortunately, I should say, as usual, quantum mechanics wins. This is what we... Well, okay, I should 
detail a little more. So you see the experiment is the following. You have the single photon arriving here. Each time a single photon arrives, after it has entered long enough in the interferometer, we choose randomly either to put or not to put the beam splitter. And we make a note of the result which is obtained here. In addition, we can also slightly change the path difference. So each time a click is recorded, we record the fact that it is recorded in D1 or D2, the fact that the beam splitter was in and out, and what was the value of the path difference. And with that, we first look at the events when the beam splitter was in. And you have a beautiful interference complementary on the two paths as a function of the path difference. And for people who have work, worked in experiment, such 94% visibility over an interferometer of 50 meters with light which is absolutely not monochromatic. It's, it's really short coherence length, a, a few tenths of microns or something like that. This is a real tour de force, okay? These young people who have done the experiment are fantastic. Then we look at the results when the beam splitter was not introduced and then really no interference at all. And again, we can test that the alpha parameter is much less than one. We are working in the single photon regime. Then we test also that if we block this path, then photons are detected only here. And if we block the other path, photons are detected only here. And there is a so-called which way parameter, uh, which is defined in the literature, we see 99%. Okay. So now it's time to conclude. The photon travels one route or the other. And here, we can tell which one. But if we introduce the beam splitter, then the photon travel both routes. So finally, the photon travels one way or both routes according to the setting, but the setting not at the moment when it enters, the setting at the moment when it is ready to go out. And there is a beautiful sentence of Wheeler, which is the following, one decides the photon shall have come by one route or by both routes after it has already done its travel. So you decide on your itinerary after you complete your travel. Isn't that weird? Okay, this is quantum weirdness. So wave particle duality is one of the great mysteries of quantum mechanics. I have several comments we can make. First, and this is very important. Weird as it is, quantum optics formalism, quantum optics equation, gives a perfect coherent account of wave particle duality. The problem arises only when you insist for making images or you insist for applying classical notion to the experiment. But if you take the full set of equation of quantum optics, you don't have to choose. The full set of equations render an account. It's the same set of equations which render an account of both uh, experiments. So this is reinsuring. Both complementary allows us to avoid too strong inconsistencies. But we should not take both complementarity in a too naive way. Because, you know, sometimes people say, oh, yes, of course, with both complementarity, I understand everything. Well, be careful. Bohr complementarity is much more subtle than it looks. And in particular, I think that the main lesson we can draw from this kind of experiment or the quantum eraser of Scully or this experiment is that when we say that an apparatus changes the behavior of a quantum object, we should absolutely not think of a mechanical action of the apparatus on the on the object you measure, and in particular, we should not stick too much into the famous image that you have of the Heisenberg microscope that by observing your particle, you change its behavior. It's much more subtle than that. Now, there is something which is fascinating and which is a, a line of the last 20 or 30 years, is that questioning the foundation of quantum mechanics is not only an academic question, but clarifying this kind of concept leads to very nice application. And for instance, here it leads to a scheme of quantum cryptography. So it is late and I, I am not going to give many details, but the idea is the following. Alice and Bob 
want to communicate, but there is an awful eavesdropper here, okay? <laughs> and the awful eavesdropper, I'm careful, you know, I used to have a, a, a description, a painting of the Renaissance of a naked woman, but now I strictly avoid this kind of images to describe Eve, okay? I think this, this uh, view of Eve is perfectly correct, right? You, you object? Yes, but you know, as a French, as a French citizen, I, I, I better be careful. Okay, very good, very good. So you are a good American. <laughs> anyway, so the nasty Eve tries to intercept the information. If you have a classical pulse, you can think that the spy can catch a small fraction of it and take some information. But if it is, if it is a single photon, then either it captures it, and then by doing some statistics, both, Bob can know that there is somebody on the line, or he cannot get any information. Of course, real quantum cryptography schemes are much more subtle than that. But the idea is that in quantum mechanics, you cannot get information without leaving a footprint. And in particular, if you have single photon state, the footprint with a beam splitter, is that either you get all of it or nothing. Right? That's the story that I, I try to show. And so, with this, well, Alice and Bob are going to be able to exchange keys and then to communicate. This is a longer story. So, this works, and uh, there are many schemes. You can even buy schemes uh, now, and uh, of course, all the armies in the world are very interested in that and give money for that, etc., etc. You know the story. Okay, before concluding, I would like to say that Bill insisted that quantum mechanics is weird, and after spending several decades in my life thinking about quantum mechanics, I think that it is fair to say that there is two different weirdness in quantum mechanics. And I have citation of Feynman about these two weirdness. The first one is the one which is emphasized in lecture on physics, where he describes this famous experiment, wave particle duality, etc. And he says, in this chapter, we shall tackle immediately the basic element of the mysterious behavior in its most strange form. We choose to examine a phenomenon which is impossible, absolutely impossible, to explain in any classical way, and which has in it the heart of quantum mechanics. And he adds, in reality, it contains the only mystery. So this was in 60, okay? And it's about wave particle duality for a single particle. But 20 years later, in 82, he talks about entanglement. And then he says, I've entertained myself always by squeezing the difficulty of quantum mechanics into a smaller and smaller place, so as to get more and more worried about this particular item. It seems to me almost ridiculous that you can squeeze it to a numerical equation that one thing is bigger than another, Bell's inequality. But there you are, it is bigger than any logical argument can produce. And the beauty of it is that after recognizing this weirdness, Feynman say, hey, we are going to do something out of it, and he invents quantum computing. So the lesson is that looking into these mysteries of quantum mechanics, you can make something hopefully useful with it. And with that, I'm going to stop, but I have to show who are the people who have done the experiment. As usual, the people who have done the experiment are the PhD students, Vincent Jacques and E, vous. E is not an acronym, that's really a Chinese name, okay? So, so now, if you go into the web of science and look for E, vous, probably there is one million of them, but that, that's the way it is. And then you have many older people, and what I like very much here is that you see there are these people, and then behind the scene, you have the godfather of that experiment. We participated in that experiment. And what I like really in this photograph, that you know, Philippe Grangier was my first PhD student. Jean-François Roque was the first PhD student of Philippe Grangier. And Vincent Jacques was the first PhD student of Jean-François Roque. So I cannot count the generations, which means, unfortunately, that I am not a young guy. OK, thank you very much.
first of all, this both uh, clarify and a confusing talk. And if you want to know about the second quantum mystery, you have to come to Iguazu Falls. Questions? Alan. Uh, yes. The traditional interpretation that the photon itself carries a weight. Yes, this is a very good like question. Uh, like uh, De Broglie proposed in 19... Well, yes, De Broglie is a... <laughs> sure. So there is a possibility to interpret wave-particle duality for a single particle is to introduce the pilot wave of De Broglie or something equivalent by Bohm and Vigier, okay? The idea is that you have a kind of wave propagating and there is one particle somewhere and this particle is guided by the wave. And the wave which interferes as maximum and minimum, and you can think about it as, as a mechanical potential, and the particle will be guided in the valley, etc., etc. It works, you are right, and this image can even uh, render an account without any conflict with the relativity of the Willers Daily Choice experiment because you introduce or not introduce at the very last moment, so you can have a re relativistic account. So the answer to that is test of Bell's inequality, because the two mysteries, whoops, which are here, this is about one particle. But violation of Bell's inequality is about two or more entangled particles. And then, if you insist on doing the De Broglie or Bohm image, then you have a non-locality in it, you have a violation of relativity. And by the way, Schrodinger, in 1926 or 1927, first came with an interpretation of quantum mechanics, which was something like an hydrodynamic interpretation, okay? You have the current of probability, and it was something in real space with currents and things like that. And then, he imme almost immediately tried to treat the equation of two particles, and then he realized that then you have to go into the configuration space, and things which are local in the configuration space are non-local in the real space, which means that something seems to travel faster than light, and Schrodinger immediately abandoned his interpretation in terms of, which is in the same spirit. So you are right for this experiment, but there is also Bell's inequality violation. Yeah. I agree, but the, the second related question is the following. When you look to a single photon experiment, it's one thing. When you look at an experiment that involves many photons, probably at the same time, uh, you have to remember that photons are bos bosons. Absolutely. And there is some correlation should appear. So what you are telling me is that we must absolutely distinguish between one photon yes, and many between, photons. Yes, between, so I, I try to broaden the scope. We must absolutely distinguish between quantum mechanics of a single particle, for instance, a single electron, we describe it by a wave function in space mm -hmm. and time, and then the many body problem for which we need to use the se second quantization formalism. Otherwise, because then we have to take into account the, the quantum statistics, etc. Is this the ex uh, explains? Uh, fully the difference between many photon experiment and no, one the, photon experiment? The case of many photons is very particular. It's a fact that most of the source that we have can be, the, if we take the full quantum formalism and the many body formalism for mm -hmm. bosons, at the end you show that it can be considered as a mixture of Glaube quasi-classical wave and then you can make the connection to classical optics and to classical waves. Just a final yes. <laughs> observation. By uh, the way, I have a comment about that. Okay. Because I realized that only recently, well, when finishing to write the book, uh, and uh, the question, is, the, the, the point is the following. If we can create single photon states, like that one, if we are sure that we have a single photon state, we can consider the mode of the classical electromagnetic field that we use for quantizing and defining the single photon, we can con consider that as a very good wave function for the photon. 
So when you see in books there is nothing like a wave function of a photon and something like that, there are strong arguments for that. But for many practical purposes, if you are sure to have a single photon state, you can consider the electromagnetic field on which you do the quantization as a wave function of the photon just as well as you have a wave function for a single electron. The difficulty comes when you have many photons, but then there is a big simplification in the case of Glauber quasi current state that, again, you can project onto our classical views. Uh -huh. Thank you. Bill, now. Now I, I better. Oh, it's your turn. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> I want to follow up on the, on the previous question. Feynman, in his little book on quantum electrodynamics, yes. the strange theory of electrons and photons. So it's a new question. <laughs> uh, well, it's not. It, it, you'll see that it's, it's related. Ah, okay. He says, well, um, let's just admit that photons are particles, but they have this strange rule that uh, describes uh, whether or not we're going to detect them, and the rule is simply the rule that, uh, that waves follow. Um, so now, uh, that sounds very much like the spirit of what you described in terms of Bohm's uh, approach or even the, um, uh, the guiding wave hypothesis. And, and for that matter, uh, these kinds of questions are just as easily posed um, uh, with exactly the same results if we talk about uh, single atoms or single sure. uh, electrons. Yes. Uh, so there's nothing magic about photons, so we could have real wave functions if we wanted and not worry about this question about whether a photon really has a wave function. And then uh, I don't suppose there's any doubt that uh, since quantum mechanics up to the point at which you make measurements is a completely deterministic theory, mm -hmm. you start off with an initial condition, it has a wave function, you describe the wave function, it doesn't matter what you do, you put in beam splitters or not, as you wish, and you can calculate the deterministic result of the wave function, and then you end up with a measurement, you apply the measurement hypothesis, and you get the answer that we all uh, agree on yes. is the answer of quantum mechanics, which has always uh, annoyingly been the answer we get in the laboratory. That is, annoyingly, if you wish to see something new. <laughs> Uh, so that picture of, uh, uh, of what happens to either the photon or the, the electron or the atom is a completely consistent picture that does not ask the question whether the, um, uh, the photon or the atom is a wave or a particle. It just says, here is the rule. Yes. So what do you have against that image that Which never asks the question except for what is the result of the experiment? Why do you, and by extension I mean everyone who thinks about this problem, insist that we answer the question, is the photon a wave or a particle? Why don't we simply say, there is a rule that we have, and here is the rule? Okay, so my, my answer will be my personal behavior, and I don't try to convert anybody, but my answer to that question is that it is only by asking such questions and accepting to clarifying them in my mind that I can get an intuition. In other words, if you come with one of these complicated schemes, <coughs> Mandel-like, you know, with uh, many devices, many beam splitters, and you say, what will happen here? Using my self-contradictory images, sometimes it's a wave, sometimes it's a particle, usually I get an intuition of what will happen. And of course, at the end, because I am a serious and a professional physicist, I take the equation, calculate the result, and say, this is the result. But if I don't have the first step of deriving and using images in my mind, then it's hard for me to think about interesting situations, okay? And so I think it is useful in that sense, okay? And of course, the price I have to pay is that in our ordinary logic, there is something self-contradictory between the images, but I learn by experience how to manage with these self-contradictory images, and I never pretend to make a full demonstration with the image. The image is good for 
smelling what is the result. And if you allow me, I want to add a comment, which may be a little provocative. I doubt that the people who have been claiming for decades that everything has been understood by Mr. Bohr and that it is a waste of time to ask this kind of question, I'm pretty sure it's not these people who have invented the new concept of quantum information. So I think that asking this kind of question and recognizing that there is something so weird in quantum mechanics that you cannot reconcile it with your usual images, this tells you that maybe you can do something new and useful with it. And that's all the idea of quantum computing. If, a, if this could boil down to classical images, you could not think of a quantum computer with totally different concepts from usual uh, computer. So it's a kind of answer to your question. Everybody has to behave as he wants, provided that at the end we agree on the rule. We all agree on the rules of the calculation. The question is, are, are we going to be innovative, inventive? Personally, I think that playing with these images is a good way of uh, finding what is interesting in the problem. Are you satisfied? Do I'm <laughs> you you play questions? with images all the time. Yeah, sure. So all this is related to entanglement, uh, collapse of the wave packet, and so on. So uh, what is this, this the state of the art in having uh, macroscopic cats, ah. like the squids that are some time ago, and the interference? Okay. These, there, are, there are many different problems. You can use quantum mechanics to describe macroscopic phenomena like superconductivity or like a laser beam or something like that. It looks macroscopic, but it's not really macroscopic. It's macroscopic only in the sense that there are ma many particles, but basically it's many particles described as the same wave function, okay? A, a Schrodinger cat is something totally different. For instance, I, I explain what I mean in optics. You have a beam splitter. You send a laser beam on it. Is it a macroscopic quantum superposition? I think no. It's many times a single photon which is split in two. So basically, it's a single photon which is split in two, and you do it many times, OK? A Schrodinger cat would be one million photon on one side and zero on the other one, or the reverse. And this is a challenge that people are following, but to my knowledge, the maximum they have done is something like a few. That is to say, the, the kind of Schrodinger cut we have been able to do up to now, by a Schrodinger cut, I mean two microscopic separable states, and I have a certain number of particles, and I have either all the particles in one state and zero in the other one, or all the particles in the other state and zero in the first one, like the cat. Either the wool cat is dead, or the wool cat is alive, okay? And uh, so to my knowledge, there is no real macroscopic in the usual sense of macroscopic. We have a little more, I mean, we have a few particles, okay? But uh, I doubt that we have real big Schrodinger cat at the moment. Do you, you, you know examples, B? Well, I'd like to make a comment on this because the, the, the question you raised was about these superconducting circuits yeah. that uh, supposedly are in cat states because they're in a superposition of, uh, of the current going one way or going the other way. Yeah. And people say, well, this is a superposition of many, many uh, uh, Cooper pairs, uh, for example. Well, uh, as opposed to some of the other experiments that have been done where uh, it's a superposition of, of perhaps three or, or yeah. four uh, particles, which sounds cat-like. Maybe it's a kitten rather than a cat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but it sounds really like a big cat if you have uh, uh, many, many Cooper pairs. Well, uh, on the other hand, if you ask what is the quantum that is uh, in superposition, it's just one flux quantum. Yes. So in that way, you might argue that it's not really a cat. It's just an ordinary... Uh, quantum superposition of two different states, one having uh, a flux quantum in one direction, the other having a flux quantum in the other direction.
but that's a little bit unsatisfying as well. Well, there was a recent calculation done by Brigitte Whaley, who is a quantum information uh, uh, person at, at Berkeley, and she decided to ask the question, how much difference is there between these two states? I like to call this the cattiness of the state. And what she found was for you a mean number of distinguishability. Yeah, how like much, that. well, how much would you have to change the, the one state going in one direction to make it into the state going in the other direction? Uh -huh. How many particles would you have to exchange uh -huh. in order to do that? Asking that very explicit question, instead of saying, well, there's this big current and there's all these uh, electron pairs. And she found that for a wide variety of such uh, experiments, if she actually um, uh, wanted to see how many particles would have to be exchanged, the number was a few particles, or at most a few tens of particles. So even these um, uh, superconducting uh, circuits are not uh, very catty in the sense that she chose to, uh, to use. So I, I'm basically agreeing with Alain. That There's a more explicit calculation that shows even for this yeah. case that seems very catty, it's not very catty. I, I can tell you something which would impress me very much is really a harmonic oscillator being simultaneously a superposition of this motion and of that motion, that is to say an harmonic oscillation doing that. Yeah. And uh, how big as to can be a harmonic oscillator doing that? You know, there are all the experiments now with the quantum resonators. Yeah. Maybe they are going sure. to find something. And, yeah. of course, exactly that experiment was done by Dave Wineland, but the difference was something like three yes. uh, phonons. This is what I say. Uh, there, so there are several <laughs> experiments in which you have a few quanta, which really, in which, in this experiment, you can really consider you have a Schrodinger kitten. Okay, it's very small, but it's more than one. Okay, it's a few quanta. Now, I would like to propose another way of describing the size of the cat. Okay. How useful is it? If you can make a cat of the sort you said, where you have a superposition of a million photons on one side and a million photons going the other side, we know we could make an interferometer using that. Much that more would sensitive, be, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, a thousand times better yeah. than a million photon yeah. uh, uh, interferometer in a coherent state. Yeah. No one has proposed any way of using these superconducting devices to make a measurement that is better than uh, an ordinary uh, squid, for example. So the utility of the cattiness, I think, is an important issue as well. A different one, uh, and not necessarily the only right one, but I think that that's an, an interesting way of thinking about the cattiness. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you, Bill. Hi, Professor. I really appreciate your work. And I have been, I have been studying non-locality a little bit and looking for your experiment. I really would like to know if you believe that the, there may be action at distance, just like uh, uh, in the sense of interpre interpreting quantum mechanics. So the question is about action at a distance, uh, right? This is, is this a question? Because as a microphone. Not, not just it, but uh, about contextuality too, because uh, I think you haven't. Uh, Spoken about it in your confluence. Uh, okay, uh, I'm not sure to fully understand the question. The, the loudspeaker are very loud. Bill, you 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 got the question is about action at a distance. Oh, I never said that there is action at a distance. So action. Uh, that's why I. Okay. So I, I no, no, but okay. So it's a very good question. Uh, there is obviously non-locality in quantum mechanics. For instance, here. Okay. Let us look here. Oh, well, let us go here, okay? Here, clearly, I like to think about this experiment as a wave arriving here 
being split into part. Okay, this is really my image. Now we speak of image. I use this kind of image. A wave arrives, is split into part. But as soon as I detect something here, instantaneously there is nothing left on the other side. This is clearly a non-local uh, feature of my image. With entanglement, it's even worse. I do a measurement here, and it changes the state of the photon which is there. This is a kind of image I use, but I know also that even with these non-localities that I accept in my image, I cannot use it for a useful transfer of information faster than the velocity of light, and this can be demonstrated. Well, you can make the reasoning, you try, you try desperately to see, okay, I do that, is there information on the other side? And unfortunately, you do the calculation and you find that there is no efficient way of using this quantum non-locality to have action at a distance in the usual sense, which is that I would do an action by propagating some kind of signal faster than light. So this is the answer. And, uh, but what is absolutely amazing is that, for instance, not here it's not so clear, but in the case of entanglement, if you think of an experiment where you have your two particles, and then you do something here, and a new image, it changes something there, but you cannot use it for efficient transfer of inf information. But if you register all the data, and when everything is finished, you compare the two sets of data, and you act as an archaeologist or an historian looking back in the past, then you must recognize that something did happen faster than light, but you could not use it. Well, quantum mechanics is weird. Professor, uh, there may be some kind of uh, a way that for this communication, and maybe we are only looking for light traveling or something like signals, Bohm's interpretation it speaks of it. I'm not sure I understand. Uh, you should speak uh, farther from the that microphone way. and... Uh... Okay, I think that's time. Let's thank Professor Aspek again. Thank you. Thank you.